All right, welcome everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for our March virtual info session. My name is Sarah Birch. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Associate Director of Admissions and Recruitment for the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. And today we're going to be talking about the Brown School with St. Louis and all the ways that we engage with our community. I'm joined by a fabulous panel of folks um, who represent a few different areas of research at the Brown School um, that's directly connected to the St. Louis community. And so I'm really excited to introduce them and allow them to share a little more about the work that they do and how um, it's benefiting the, the St. Louis area. Before we get started with introductions though, just a couple of housekeeping items. So this session is being recorded and we'll share the recording on our YouTube channel after this uh, has been completed. So you can always go back and check again to watch later. Um, if you have questions, we certainly wanna make time for that at the end of the session. We received some good questions beforehand that we're gonna um, try to address, but we also wanna address any questions that you have. So if you'd like to use the Q&A function in the webinar, which is at the bottom of the screen, you can use that at any time and we'll do our best to get as many, get to as many questions as we can um, at the end of our presentation. And so with that, I would like to now go ahead and introduce my panelists. Uh, these are the folks here with me today and I will just have each of you go down the list starting with Gina, um, just share your name, your pronouns, your role at the Brown School and um, what it was that brought you to the Brown School and to St. Louis in a couple sentences. Okay. Hi, everyone. And, and thank you so much for your interest in, in coming to the Brown School. It's a place that I think you will thoroughly enjoy. Again, my name is uh, Dr. Gina McClendon, and I work in the Center for Social Development, which is a research center, um, which has been involved with this with the university for the last 30 years. But what brought me to the university, I was actually invited to apply for a position by the then um, co-founder of the center. And her interest in me and my interest in the center had everything to do with how people are able to lift themselves out of poverty, if you will. You know, to, to what extent can we do some things to, to do that? And so, that's what brought me here, and I've been here for the last 21 years. Do you want me to go next? Okay. Uh, I'm Nicola Doherty, uh, she, her, her pronouns, um, and I'm the Associate Director at the Brown School Evaluation Center. Uh, I've been at the Brown School for a little over 10 years now, uh, and I came here due to a relocation of my family to the St. Louis region and uh, really wanted, to, I had been previously been doing evaluation work with nonprofits as an internal evaluator, as well as, as in different cons consulting firms and think tanks, but was really excited about translating that work and doing evaluation in the context of higher ed and really drawn to the Brown School's approach of kind of a very participatory approach to evaluation and engaging stakeholders throughout the evaluation process. So. This is my turn. Uh, hi, everybody. I am Derek Collin, pronouns are he, him. I work in the Prevention Research Center uh, here at the Brown School. I originally came here as a master's student in, for the public health program in like 2016, and then graduated in 2018 and moved back to where I grew up uh, in Philly and was looking for opportunities uh, to get more research, uh, research work practice. So I hit, uh, talked to a couple of my old professors here and ended up getting a position at the PRC as a research project manager uh, for the project I'm working with now with uh, Anya, the research, my research assistant, who is also on this on this panel with us. So, yes, that's me. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending where you're joining from. I'm Callie Walsh Bailey. I use she, her pronouns, uh, and I'm a public health sciences doctoral student in the Brown School, and also work as a research assistant in the Prevention Research Center. 
Um, and there were really two uh, big factors that drew me to the Brown School. Um, the first is that I'm very interested in implementation science, which is the study of how do we actually get these really effective beneficial programs and practices that we develop uh, into the clinics and into the communities to benefit the folks that they were designed for. Um, and WashU is really, <laughs> some people call it the mothership um, for that field. Literally the folks that wrote the book on the field are um, all faculty here. Um, and so I figured there's really no better place to do my studies. Um, and the second is that I came out of a very community driven uh, master's of public health uh, and really wanted to continue that into my PhD studies um, and was really drawn to uh, the mission of the Brown School to really um, strive for equity in the work that we do and to have community impact. Hi all, my name is Anya O'Connor, uh, she, her pronouns, and I am a master's research fellow at the Prevention Research Center in my second and final year of the master's in public health. Um, I came to the Brown School, I, came, I was at WashU for undergrad and I did not expect to come back, but I was working in St. Louis in economic development and um, was really missing the community centered focus on in that work. And so I knew I wanted to go into public health to get sort of the tools and resources to be able to more effectively work with and in community. And um, the Brown School was a natural choice for that because there's not only was it in St. Louis, which is where I was, but also a great deal of really good work happening. Um, so that's how I ended up here. Hi, my name is Deja Miles. I am a joint degree candidate here at Washington University. So I'm at the Brown School and I also am um, participating in studies at Olin, Olin uh, Business School. Um, I really enjoyed my time here at Brown and originally I chose Brown specifically because I really wanted to um, kind of change the trajectory of infant and maternal mortality. Um, I really saw um, when I entered the program, that is specifically what I was interested in. Um, along the way, those interests, um, those interests have evolved so um, and changed, but I still, um, that is ultimately what brought me to the Brown School. Excellent, thank you all so much. I'm really looking forward to hearing each of you talk a little bit more um, about the work that you're currently involved in. Before we get to that, I wanted to provide just a very brief overview of just some of the ways that the Brown School is connected to the St. Louis community. So um, it's kind of funny to think about this now because we've all been working um, remotely for a year, um, but, but pre-pandemic, I would be on the road recruiting and talking to students uh, potential students all across the country, and I'd always get the question, where, where are you located? Washington University, is that in Washington, D.C.? Is that in Seattle? Uh, so we would uh, always uh, have to say we are Washington University in St. Louis, um, but the longer that I've worked here, the more I just see how integral that piece is to the institution that is WashU, but also the Brown School. And so, um, you know, we over the last several years of being an institution have built such strong relationships with local organizations. The Brown School specifically has over 300 affiliations with local organizations where many of our students participate in practicum and over 200,000 hours of, of student time is dedicated in those spaces each year. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about practicum and field education and how you can get involved in St. Louis in those ways, we actually hosted a virtual info session last month talking all about field education at the Brown School, so you can check that out. Um, but in addition to those, um, those organization connections, we have some really um, strong partnerships with some organizations, two administrative partners that you can read a little bit more about on our website, Family Forward and Better Family Life. Um, Cynthia Williams is the associate or the dean for um, community initiatives at the Brown School, and she'll actually be talking about this and some more information about St. Louis during admitted student week. So if you're an admitted student and want to join us for admitted student week in April, you can listen to Cynthia talk more about those partnerships 
um, specifically. We have three community-based research initiatives, Health Equity Works, which is led by Dr. Jason Purnell, Homegrown STL, which is led by Dr. Sean Joe, and Community Academic Partnership on Addiction, or CAPA, which is led by Dr. David Patterson Silverwolf. Um, again, all of these you can find a little bit more information about on our website, but um, please feel free to ask questions and reach out if you want to learn a little bit more about these. And finally, we have 15 affiliated faculty affiliated research centers at the Brown School. Um, and we're going to be zooming in on some of the work of three of those centers specifically with our panelists today. Um, so much of the work, it, it really is um, in connection and in collaboration um, and partnership with the, the St. Louis community. Um, and that's what we're going to be really focusing on in our conversation today. We'll go ahead and get started with Gina um, and uh, talk about the Center for Social Development and her work specifically with voter access. You're muted, Gina. Aha, thank you. Um, so again, I've been with the Center for 21 years. And so in, in that time period, um, I've seen the center evolve into um, several different bodies of work. But again, we our research center whose idea is to uh, create and study innovations, interventions, and practices that help or enable families and individuals to, and communities to um, achieve whatever their, their life goals are. And so um, the reason why the center got started is we are of the belief that people are, are in poverty, not because of bad decisions that they made, but because of bad policies. And so the policy end uh, of our, the research that we do is just extremely important. And why do I say that? The reason why I say that is that um, the way that we view this is that in order to receive public benefits, for example, your income has to be a certain amount, okay? And then if you have assets, those things that you own can't be, can't exceed a certain limit. So what that does is it allows you to continually be in poverty. And so what we have been trying to do is figure out ways to lift people out. Um, and so um, the areas of work that we do that relate to that have to do with um, financial inclusion, rates and in inequality and social mobility, social justice, civic engagement and service, child and youth well-being, environmental and social development and thriving communities. And so since I don't have a whole lot of time, um, I'm going to focus on financial inclusion and civic engagement. And before I go any further, Dr. Shradden is faculty. I did not put that on this slide, but he is, is our director and founder and um, is still uh, a practicing faculty member. Okay, so I wanna focus on civic engagement and service uh, first. And so under that category, we have different initiatives, one of which is the one that I direct um, the voter access and engagement. We have community and national service, international service and productive aging. So the voter access and engagement initiative began in shortly after the 2016 election. I think one of the things that we agreed on is that um, we were concerned about democracy. So the voter access and engagement initiative is about protecting the democracy of people. It's about voting rights and with a special focus on race and racism and, and racial justice when it comes to voting, because a lot of things that um, when it comes to voter suppression are targeted at people of color. And so when we first got started, one of the things that we had to do was to, to kind of do a, take a scan and see what organizations were out there, who's on first, who's on second, how, how do we do this work? How do we build this work? We knew that we didn't want to do a couple of things. We knew that we wanted to do research. We knew that we wanted to create an inclusive democracy. We knew that we wanted to support other organizations and toward with their advocacy and their engagement efforts. 
And we knew that we wanted to engage uh, a new generation of voter protectors who we uh, who are our students, right? So we wanted them to be prepared. So democracy thrives when it's practiced and not prevented. So as we were scanning and we were developing and figuring out what we were going to do, we decided to do a research project. And if you click on the research link there, this describes the initiative, uh, the research initiative that we did. Not working? say that um, the research that we did, um, we actually had students that were student researchers. In fact, one of our panelists participated with us on, on our research project and um, yeah, participated with us on the, the research project. And so that tells a story. So that happened right here in St. Louis, where we were really focusing on um, what are the things that prevent people from being able to vote. So again, you know, we're, we're talking about a democracy now moving forward that's in crisis and that's rooted in racism when it comes to anti-protesting legislation. I don't know if you're aware that there is legislation out there trying to prevent people from being able to protest and making it a felony if you do. We're talking about economic and financial inequality that's all rooted in racism and it's rooted in, in democracy. Um, take a look at the two pictures on the right. Uh, one of those pictures, I put one of them in black and white on purpose. The one at the bottom is from uh, Bloody Sunday that was in, uh, in Selma, Alabama, which they, the 56th anniversary of that day um, happened um, a couple of days ago. But there really isn't a big difference between what went on then and what's going on now. And so um, the way that we see to get to the other side of this is by making sure that the democracy and the rights of people are um, protected. There, at the bottom there, there's a, a link that, to uh, this video called Yellow Pain. I'm not gonna have you play it. We don't have enough time, but if you're taking notes, and I'm sure um, Sarah's gonna send this out, be sure to look at it. It really explains uh, from a young person's perspective why people don't vote. Next slide. So the, the other, another uh, piece that we do is financial inclusion. And under that, we have initiatives in asset building in the United States, global asset building, financial capability, and financial behaviors. And so each one of those initiatives is managed by some faculty director who does different types of, of projects under that particular category. So we have a thriving global asset building initiative that is directed by several people in and mostly outside of the university, but they have a, a faculty relationship with us. But the one that I'm gonna focus on is the financial capability. So when I say financial capability, what I'm talking about is a person being not only just understanding and knowing 
how to um, manage their money, financial education. Some people refer to it as literacy, but also what are the things or what are the policies, what are the practices that people or clients or poor people need to have access to. So it's one thing to be able to know how to, to, to balance your checkbook if you even have a checking account, but it's another thing to know how to navigate products and serve financial products and services. And so we kind of put a focus on that. And then we, at some point we started putting more of our emphasis on developing a curriculum for social work because this particular type of thing was part of social work many, many years ago, as, as was voting and democracy, um, but somewhere in there it was taken out. So we were spending a significant amount of our resources and our time on um, a curriculum, along with research. And then we have a pretty growing scholar network. So we have a network of, of people all over the country who are doing work around this. And then what else, the other thing that falls under financial capability is the American Academy of Social Work and Social Welfare, AASWSW, something called the Grand Challenges of Social Work. And the Brown School has three, there are 12, well, now there's a 13th Grand Challenge. The three of the 13 came out of the Brown School. And the one that we are specifically working with or doing is the Building Financial Capability and Assets for All. And I think that's my last slide. Thank you, Gina. All right, next uh, we'll have Nicole talk about the Evaluation Center. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so I'm with the Brown School Evaluation Center, which was launched about five and a half years ago, really as a strategic initiative of the Brown School in response to what we were hearing from many local and regional community-based organizations, nonprofits, social service agencies, really around this desire to better understand how do I evaluate my program or change effort? And how do I demonstrate the impacts I'm having on the community members or populations that we serve? And in, in general, as I mentioned before, part of what drew me to the Brown School was this kind of a principle around participatory approach to evaluation. And what that really just means is that there's the strong value in engaging diverse stakeholders, anything from program implementers to policymakers to board members to community members in the evaluation throughout the evaluation process to really help to co-construct the design, the implementation of any evaluation, as well as to co-construct the interpretation of evaluation findings into really truly meaningful and actionable recommendations. So we like to think of our work kind of as a three-legged stool. Um, we, our first leg is really to provide evaluation services, which is a majority of what our work comprises. It's anything from helping organizations who may not have an, even a starting point of really developing a clear evaluation plan, you know, what questions do we want to be able to answer about our program or our change effort um, to anything to random control trials and multi-site mi mix methods, uh, multi-year process and outcome evaluation. So we provide services on that full spectrum of um, evaluations to community-based organizations, social services agencies, and what have you. The second leg of our stool is really around enhancing evaluation capacity. And this could be of individuals or of organizations. And we do this in a couple of different ways. One is through providing technical assistance, trainings, uh, workshops on evaluation related topics to community members, community organizations. And we do this through the Brown Professional Development Arm, um, but we also do tailored workshops for organizations on a number of topics such as logic models or qualitative data collection and analysis or project management um, and dissemination best practices. And then we also have recently launched a couple of post-master certificate programs um, in program evaluation and most recently in communicating and visualizing data. And a number of our local organizations participate in those certificate programs as well. And uh, the third leg of our stool is really just kind of advancing 
the uh, science of evaluation or the practice of evaluation, if you will. And so we primarily do this through the development of manuscripts and participation in a local affiliate uh, organization here called the Evaluation Association of St. Louis, which is the local affiliate of the national organization of the American Evaluation Association. And um, we also develop white papers kind of on best practices in um, evaluation, particularly around this participatory approach of engaging stakeholders throughout the process. Uh, and we engage students in all of our work uh, through practicum opportunities and through part-time graduate research assistant, research assistants or evaluation assistant positions. Uh, next slide. So we work with numerous partners regionally, um, locally, as well as nationally. I would say that about 75% of our partners over the last five and a half years have been here in the greater St. Louis region or in the state of Missouri. Um, and so we've probably worked with over 80 unique partners during that time frame. And so today I'm just going to highlight a couple of our current projects to give you a flavor of the, the kind of the, the types of partnerships and work that we do here regionally. And the first of these is uh, it's a National Institutes of Health Research Grant where we're working with individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities because we know that they are disproportionately affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And so we're working in close partnership with the WashU Medical School, as well as a couple of other Brown School centers and faculty members, and with this special school district here in St. Louis, uh, really on this grant to better understand and develop a strategy around implementing COVID-19 diagnostic testing for children with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and also identifying what are the barriers and the facilitators to the uptake of the effectiveness of this diagnostic testing strategies for families, caregivers, and educators in the school setting. And then also lastly, to really better understand the best practices of around how do we talk about COVID-19 testing in school step settings. Um, so our role, the Evaluation Center's role on this project is primarily to lead multiple series of discussion sessions and interviews with parents, teachers, staff, and administrators, and also to facilitate community-engaged data parties or kind of uh, co-interpretation co meetings. Again, like we said, we want to bring stakeholders to the table to help. They're really the experts and to really co-construct the meaning of what we're learning and through various data collection methods. And then lastly, we also are supporting the development of tailored dissemination products about what we're learning to speak to different stakeholder audiences. Next slide. We are also working very closely with Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Eastern Missouri on a multi-year fu project funded through the Missouri Foundation of Health. And as you can see on this slide, it has three primary phases of work um, for this research project. And the first phase was really trying to better understand um, and through the, the analysis of a ton of retrospective data uh, to understand the dynamic factors that impact mentoring relationships. Uh, and so we, uh, the Evaluation Center analyzed those data as well as collected new qualitative data um, through focus groups and interviews with bigs, littles, and staff and parents and guardians to, yes, understand really how and why these mentoring relationships are enduring or strong. And then the second phase of this work is where we are now. It's like we've, we've actually learned a lot from these data and have some clear kind of recommendations about what a new, what that would help to inform uh, uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters kind of redesigning their service delivery model to be enhanced uh, based on this findings. And then lastly, you know, the third phase after that redesign would be to collect new data and understand what impacts the, the changes on the service delivery model are having for outcomes. Next slide. All right. Okay, so, and then last project that I wanted to share with you all today is uh, called, is around Project Launch. It's an evaluation project. And Project Launch is a, an initiative with a local organization here called Vision for Children at Risk. And it's really just a child wellness promotion grant that's uh, federally funded. And Vision for Children at Risk 
um, is really aim, aiming to foster the healthy development and wellness of young children from ages zero to eight in the city of St. Louis. And so Project Launch um, is really, BCR I should say, our Vision for Children at Risk is really trying to improve coordination and collaboration among family and child serving systems. They're trying to better enhance the knowledge and related behaviors of parents of children from birth to age eight on topics such as early child development and community and providing more resources and also increasing the capacity of early child care providers on topics related to uh, social emotional development. So we're working in close partnership with Dr. Trish Coles, faculty member here at the Brown School, um, to evaluate this five-year initiative. Um, and where we use employing, again, mixed methods of both a process and outcome evaluation to really try to assess the degree to which the goals and objectives um, are being met and what are the barriers and facilitators to meeting those objectives. Um, and uh, so those are just a flavor of some of the, the projects we're currently working on. Thank you, Nicole. Finally, we're gonna talk about some of the work happening at the Prevention Research Center. I'll have Callie start and then Derek and Anya can share anything that they'd like about their projects as well. Thanks so much. Um, I first just want to say um, I wasn't I was very surprised to uh, find what a home the Prevention Research Center has really felt like. Um, and we recently have done a lot of work um, before COVID, but continuing on now um, to really look ahead at what does the next five years of our center look like. Um, and we really came together on uh, this common vision that really our work centers around uh, improving the community's health and achieving equity. Um, and we made sure that that was explicitly in our mission statement. And we do this through a, a wide, wide array of approaches. Um, a lot of the work centers around uh, physical inactivity, um, the built environment and nutrition. Um, we do some both can more um, community led um, interventions as well as um, trying to impact the broader policy level. Um, and the one thing that I can say, having been at the Brown School both pre-COVID and now during um, the pandemic period, um, just how responsive a lot of this work has been to the um, continually emerging needs. Um, so I'm going to describe like a couple of those projects um, and how our work has evolved to um, kind of meet needs as they come up. Um, and Derek will get into some of the work that he's been doing as well. Um, so one of the projects that I want to highlight um, is our mapping cancer prevention project. Um, so we used a social network analysis approach to map collaborations between community organizations who are working on uh, cancer prevention and screening very broadly. So these could be things like physical activity and nutrition uh, intervention, smoking cessation, um, and actually getting community members uh, into clinical settings to get their screenings done. Um, and of course, uh, we did this work in the midst of COVID, and so their needs really shifted. Um, and as a student, I was really fortunate that I got to take the lead on, on the COVID-specific arm uh, and look at what these organizations are doing in uh, not just the St. Louis uh, region, but also some of the rural communities uh, as well in the uh, eastern part of the state uh, to get a handle on what are some of their needs, um, what are their gaps for serving clients in their communities, um, and what are some of the resources that they need to be able to continue doing this uh, important prevention work uh, while also addressing um, pan pandemic related needs. Um, and so we currently are in the stage where we're doing a lot of data sharing. So this wasn't intended that we just get, you know, a paper or a usual academic product, um, but really wanted to put the data that we gathered back into the hands of the community organizations so they could use it uh, to address the needs that we identified uh, and better serve their communities. Um, so we've been reading, uh, meeting with um, some local as well as regional partners, um, anywhere from patient advocacy groups to uh, local chapters of the American Cancer Society, American Lung Association, um, kind of walking through our data, doing some of that science communications work so they can then pick it up um, and inform some of the practices um, and kind of some of the programs that they're offering in their communities. 
um, again, both in St. Louis and some of the more um, regional um, rural areas as well. Um, and we're also supporting um, a rural federally qualified health center and a rural counties uh, wellness council in writing a grant, again, using um, our study as pilot data to show some of the needs that have come up. Um, and we're kind of lending our expertise uh, to helping them secure some funding so they can um, build out programs to um, kind of meet as particularly food insecurity and transportation barriers um, for their community members. Um, another uh, piece of work that I want to highlight um, that again is demonstrating how we've used data to be responsive to a community need um, is the Forward Through Ferguson um, group. So this was actually a group that was co-founded um, by a former Brown School student uh, in the wake of um, Michael Brown's murder. Um, and this group really focuses on uh, bringing uh, racial equity and justice to the North St. Louis region. Um, which I'm sure many folks who have done their research on St. Louis um, has been a historically uh, underserved uh, and systematically disenfranchised community. So that again is kind of bringing data resources and funding uh, to come up with goals that that community has identified um, to kind of strengthen that neighborhood uh, and fund uh, racial justice initiatives. Um, I think my audio was kind of out for that, I realized. Um, I don't know how much of that you guys got. I've heard racial justice initiatives and that's where it cut off. Okay, um, I think you guys got the rest of it. Okay. All right, now I'll have Derek talk about his project with Forest Park. Yeah, hey everyone. So our project, um, the project that I manage and Anya is a master's research fellow with sits within the PRC. So one of those very uh, community focused uh, projects is called, I guess internally, the Forest Park Forest Park Visitor and Community Survey and externally to most people, the Park to Parks, which stands for Park Activity Recreational and Community Study. It's a multi-pronged, uh, multi-year study funded by a community partner uh, that started in 2019. Uh, the, the community partner is Forest Park Forever and also works in collaboration with the city, city department, city planning department, and community organizations and community members within uh, St. Louis. So our project has four main aims. Uh, the first one is to diagnose uh, spatial temporal patterns of use within a park. So pretty much understanding who comes to the park, how many people come to the park, looking at demographic makeup of who comes to the park and what activities go on or what activities those people do when they come to the park. The second thing we are trying to do is to understand who those current people are, as I said, and what drives them to use the park. So reasons to come or reasons people do not come or have access to or decide to access Forest Park, which for, I guess, uh, people who don't know, Forest Park is the largest park in the St. Louis region and one of the largest urban city parks in the United States. Um, it's often compared to Central Park in New York as one of the biggest parks uh, in, the, in the country in our urban area. So the third thing that we also aim to do is to identify which members of the groups or communities aren't currently visiting Forest Park and why that's the case, as I said as well. And lastly, after going through those three other aims to understand and develop actionable recommendations um, to provide to community, partner, community partners, uh, city partners, to improve upon the use and access of the park, um, park access, park assets, uh, improving access to the park for local residents and um, local residents, and currently trying to find challenging ways to, or currently trying to improve ways to get uh, St. Louis residents to visit the park itself. So, in that study that we're in, this study that we're doing parks, there are five, or really four main components that um, make up the study. Uh, two of the components, stakeholder interviews and focus groups are qualitative focus, so I kind of lumped them both together and that is the part or, or piece of the project that Anya um, leads on. So I'll let you talk about that after I go through uh, the other two or not, yeah, go through the other three, which you also do most of the work for our voice. Um, <laughs> but uh, so of the components of parks, so park is the system for observing uh, 
observing play in recreational communities. So Soul Park is, um, was developed by a researcher at San Diego State University. And I should also note that uh, the principal investigator, the lead for the study is uh, Dr. Salvo, uh, Dr. Deborah Salvo. Um, and uh, this is pretty much a system of direct observation where me and our team members, including Anya, literally go into Forest Park and scan specific, specified mapped out areas of the entirety of Forest Park and literally count the people there, um, describe the activities they're doing and record that data and then use that to then analyze who's at the park in general, get an overall number of amount of visitors of the park and activities done at the park to answer some of those aims. Um, the other three, I should say, parts of, uh, parts of parks that are more qualitative focus are our voice, stakeholder interviews and focus groups. Um, we conducted stakeholder interviews and focus groups in the last year, um, which comprised of about 25 different community members, including community members and stakeholders from aldermen, um, governmental officials, um, other community leads, and all, also community members. Um, and the other aspect of the study that I will talk about really quick is uh, GPS and accelerometry portion of the study which hasn't begun yet. Um, and another thing about our studies that was really impacted a lot by COVID, we were in, in the park every day conducting um, in-person interviews and literally counting people. So we actually had to uh, stop early uh, the so Park portion of the study and kind of lean more into the digital capabilities of conducting qualitative research, which has been really great for us. And again, really great to have on as a part of our team doing really um, a lot of the work with this. So the GPA accelerometry study, accelerometry portion of the study hasn't begun yet, but we are planning to try to start it in the summer, which pretty much uses, utilizes GPS technology to track um, people who come through the park and patterns of, patterns of movement throughout the park to understand how people utilize the actual forest park space, um, which is, I believe three miles by two miles by six miles long. So um, I forgot, that's really basic math, but I forgot the generator of it. Um, so that's the GPS and accelerometer, accelerometry portion of the study. And Anya, I'm gonna let you talk more about our voice. And if you wanna say any more about what we do with focus groups and, or what we did with focus groups and stakeholder interviews. Cool, thanks. Um, so the qualitative portions of this study come from you know, the idea that you can't, we can't get all of our information about why people use the park or why they don't use the park from just observing who's there. Um, so the, we've done a variety of different surveys and, um, you know, outreach digitally and in person as Derek mentioned, but the stakeholder interviews and the focus groups were really um, targeted and focused uh, interviews with a variety of different people stakeholders of the park, people who, you know, represented organizations or city departments or nonprofits in the area um, or wards of the city who might have uh, something to something to do with the way that Forest Park is run and operated um, and who have constituents or representatives or clients who may or may not use the park for various reasons. And we're now in the process of we actually, you know, recorded all of those interviews via Zoom at this point. Um, since all of this happened after COVID. And we have had those all transcribed. The research team's been editing the transcriptions and now we're ready to actually begin qualitative analysis, which involves you know, trying to extract main themes from the things that people are saying, um, coding them, and then kind of doing a, a breakdown of what people are saying about how they use the park, how they don't use the park, and whether or not they have access and why. Um, the portion of the qualitative piece of parks that I've been most excited about is um, Our Voice. No hate to the other portions, but Our Voice, I think, is the most exciting. Um, it's, a, it's a process out of Stanford University that's citizen science. So uh, it's community-based participatory research in which actually all the data that is gained is done by community members. Um, we give them a little training. They go out and collect information about their trip through and to the park. 
Um, so things that make it easy for them to go, things that make it hard for them to go, and then the, you know, anything that encourages or acts as a barrier to their use of the park. And they come back, um, we facilitate meetings with them, again, over Zoom at this point, where we work with them, where they extract themes from their data. And then um, finally, there's, we just finished our, our first one of these earlier in the week. There's actually an advocacy meeting in which we set up, uh, we set up and mildly facilitate a meeting between our citizen scientists and park stakeholders. So people who are actually making decisions about the things that, um, that they identified as main themes. And the citizen scientists present solution ideas to these organizations, departments, park stakeholders who then are asked to respond saying, you know, yes, this is possible. No, it isn't. Um, this is what we can do. Here's, you know, a pathway for continued engagement. So it's a really excellent way of getting community priorities in front of stakeholders who actually have decision making power about what does and doesn't happen in the park. Um, and it's been really fun to do. We, we just finished uh, all of these phases with our frequent park user group and we're just about to begin recruiting for the, the non regular users. So we have a couple of um, target zip codes that we're going to be recruiting from in the St. Louis area to get the same to go through the same process and see what, you know, community as a whole in St. Louis um, sees as barriers and facilitators of use of the park. So that's been really exciting. And that's the qualitative portion so far. Great, thank you, Anya and Derek. Now we've got just a couple other um, projects to uh, go over. So Callie, I'll have turn it back to you to talk about these two. Yeah, so one of the other things that I've been really excited about in the Brown School is the really cool and unique opportunities that we have to uh, also collaborate with folks at the medical school and really bring that public health perspective to the clinical setting. So we're thinking about not just treating problems, but how to actually prevent them um, how to, and how to think about community health more broadly, um, which is a perspective that I think is often missing from the medical system. So we have a couple of examples of that work going on now. Um, these are both led by Dr. Mara Kepper, who is not here because she is meeting with our community advisory board, who is um, giving us, again, the patient and community member input on what our work should actually look like. Um, so the first is um, a health information technology tool, um, which right now is a standalone app, but we are eventually envisioning would be integrated into an electronic health record. And this uses uh, patient data to come up with um, tailored evidence-based physical activity and food intake recommendations for adolescent patients who are overweight or obese and uh, are at risk of developing chronic diseases. Um, and so through uh, patient and healthcare provider input, uh, we uh, designed the features of this app and kind of developed some key ways in which providers can use it with their patients. Um, and right now we're piloting this into clinics at um, the Barn Jewish uh, hospital at the medical campus. Um, and uh, the cool thing for me is that this also integrates community level data um, to help directly connect patients to resources that can help them improve their health. So things like uh, parks, food banks, uh, food pantries, WIC programs, um, anything that they might be currently lacking or just maybe haven't thought of yet to um, utilize to improve their health. Um, we're directly, um, directly connecting those um, resources to patients at the point of care. And then we can go to the next one, um, which an, uh, oops, <laughs> is another way of um, looking at social determinants of health in a clinical setting. Uh, so right now, we are investigating how um, healthcare providers are uh, talking to patients about their social needs and how that information actually gets documented in a patient's uh, electronic health record. Um, and then uh, whether or not, you know, there's any sort of um, resource or follow-up uh, to help address some of those needs again at the point of care. Um, what we're finding so far is, of course, um, there are many um, groups within the St. Louis community that have, um, you know, some pretty obvious health disparities that I think um, the healthcare system has 
uh, not effectively addressed so far. And so we're really trying again, bringing in that community perspective and looking at what can we do right now uh, in our healthcare system to actually address some of those needs. Um, and so kind of next steps um, for us with this project is we're meeting with uh, some of the directors of um, community development and outreach at the hospital, as well as some of the other Brown School faculty who have uh, connections with these community organizations to come up with a stakeholder driven approach of we've identified these needs. Um, what are the solutions going forward look like? What do patients and community members want um, from their healthcare providers? Thank you, Callie. So at this time, I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And um, we've got about eight minutes uh, left to answer questions. I've got a couple that were submitted beforehand that I'd love to ask. And then um, for those watching live with us, please feel free to use that Q&A function and we'll try to get to some of those in the time that we have. Um, but the first one I want to ask, and I want to loop Deja into the conversation, um, and because someone actually asked how have MPH students um, engaged in the St. Louis community, and of course Anya and Derek as an alum uh, of the MPH program can answer this too, but Deja, if you want to talk a little bit about um, how you've been involved as an MPH, but then I'll, you're an NBA student too, so you have kind of a unique perspective. Um, yeah, so my time has been extremely rich. Um, I have really enjoyed my time. Nicole has been an amazing preceptor. So she has kind of molded me into um, a little evaluation, um, <laughs> up and coming evaluation consultant. And so a lot of the project that I'm working on right now is the Radix project. And I really enjoy that. So I worked on everything from data collection through the focus group setting uh, with staff and parents uh, through special school district. And then I also extracted and cleaned the data um, so that apart, um, a lot of a ton of the analysis and then towards the end and right now we worked on the node reports and kind of really polishing and perfecting the communication strategies and so that is where the project is right now. Um, most recently I was assigned to like four other projects. Um, so um, huge involvement. I say all of that to say, to really answer your question, a lot of involvement. Um, there's no shortage of projects to work on, especially if you are working for one of the facilities that uh, was mentioned here today. Um, so, um, and then some, com some of the other projects that I worked on my first year, uh, um, Dr. McClendon kind of mentioned the voting project. I worked on that. So while at the evaluation center, that was another way to kind of get my foot wet, uh, feet wet with some of the research that I was really interested in personally. Um, so there's no shortage of opportunities. Um, I like to use the metaphor um, when you enter a master's program at WashU, it's kind of like having your mouth open with a fire hydrant coming at you. Um, and that is really true in regard, like you have so many opportunities that you'll have to be selective with your time so that you can really um, um, enjoy and really learn from each project. Thank you. Yeah, and then uh, I know Anya, you were able to share a little bit about what the work that you've been doing. Derek, you are an alum of the MPH program and worked uh, with the Health Equity Works uh, project. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you got involved with that? Because I know a lot of folks are really interested in getting involved and want to know how you do it. So, yeah, um, well, I, first of all, when I worked with Health Equity Work, it was called For the Sake of All. <laughs> so I think it changed the name like literally right after I graduated in 2018. But I, um, as a admitted student, um, applied to be a master's research fellow for a couple of centers and uh, decided to work with Health Equity, what is now Health, Health Equity Works. Um, and I think uh, going on what Deja said, there were, and uh, speaking, I think for the, my friends and people I knew in my cohort and even people after me, there are a lot of opportunities, um, not only for MPA students, but for all of the graduate students at the Brown School to be involved in research opportunities. Um, and I also always say that the, the research faculty and the faculty in general at WashU are always very, I think, receptive to students, even like cold emailing them or coming up to them in class, like asking for research opportunities. I know specifically in the PRC, um, we are always getting emails um, about students who reach out to our associate director, our director, looking for uh, research opportunities and um, taking on new research assistants uh, on a consistent basis. And I also 
as a student outside of working for Health Equity Works, was able to work with a professor in the PRC, Amy Eiler, from our practicum. By talking to her, um, she taught my health behavior class and was able to also work with uh, Dr. Daryl Hudson by just emailing him, asking him if he needed help over the summer with qualitative research. Um, so I was able to get a lot of opportunities um, just by talking and networking with my cohort and then just talking to um, and reaching out to professors who I honestly looked up and was interested in the work they were doing. That's really helpful. And hopefully that answers the question that was submitted um, in the Q&A. You know, how often does it occur that a student will begin and end up working with closely with certain professors whose field work kind of definitively matches uh, a student interest and future goals and while they're still in school? And I think the answer to that question too is, you know, you may not be doing something that definitively matches what you think you wanted to come to the Brown School, but the work that you do will end up shaping what your interests are, if that sounds right from my, uh, my student participants. Um, anything else to add about just getting involved in work and, and finding things that are really aligned with your goals? The only thing um, the only thing I would add is just that it's very important to understand that even though the research type or you, maybe you have a certain research area and you're not able to really uh, research that, learn the skill set. So um, learn what your preceptor has to teach you because that can be applied in a variety of settings and functions when you exit or whether you enter a PhD program post um, MPH. And so I think um, that's what I've learned throughout the process. Thank you. We have a couple minutes left, um, and I certainly want to get to questions that were answered uh, during the session. Michael, you asked a really good question um, uh, that can express enough how much the Brown School faculty, staff, and students of community relations have stand out among my experiences with other higher quality schools of social welfare. It seems like much of the evaluation center's work is initiated by community members asking for assistance. So this is a question for uh, the PRC and CSD, um, how do you choose new areas to do research and in which to intervene? And Gina, I'll start with you with that question. Well, that's a great question, Michael. Um, so our work at the center is sort of based on, so evolutions, right? So at the beginning, we were looking at um, interventions that we could do to lift people out of poverty. So like, for example, child development accounts, that's a, a huge body of work for us. And so um, it's gone from an individual basis to children. And that has been, you know, maybe our primary pur purpose um, with our research. And so it's evolved into to different sorts of things. Um, with the voting work, um, that actually came about because of what was trending. And it had a lot to do with what social work or what social work has done and could do to improve the quality of life for people. So that's sort of what drives what we do, sort of our mission, as opposed to just creating new bodies of work. And then of course, money drives that as well. So you need resources. Research is extremely expensive. So we're very um, particular about what we pick to, to do. I can jump off of that. I think there's a couple of things that dovetail with the PRC's approach as well as Dr. McLennan was talking about. That mission-driven piece is really important. So for every new funding opportunity or project proposal, we look at is this mission consistent? And so for us, is this something that would improve the community's health and promote health equity? Um, and again, kind of look at our strengths. So we have a lot of expertise in physical activity in the built environment, a lot of expertise in um, nutrition and prevention. Um, and then again, you know, the funding as well, just what is available. I know faculty in the PRC are very mindful of uh, compensating students for their time and effort. And so um, what opportunities allow for um, a funding a, a research assistance time is also really important. Thank you both so much for those answers. I think that kind of 
wraps things up beautifully. I know there are so many more things that we could get into, but with just an hour to touch on all of the ways that the Brown School is involved in the community, um, we can't. So if you have more questions, please feel free to reach out to any of us on the panel. A lot of my panelists share their contact info. If they are open to having folks reach out. I'm gonna share my screen one last time with just some next steps um, for all those who are watching with us live today. So um, let me put this in full screen. If you've not applied to the Brown School yet or you're waiting for an admission decision still, uh, those are coming your way, but we are enrolling admissions for fall 21 now. So if you still are considering applying, um, please reach out to us. Some important dates to keep in mind for admitted students. We have admitted student week coming up April 5th through 9th, where um, we'll actually have an entire day dedicated to St. Louis, talking about not only the ways that we're involved um, as a school, but what you do as someone who lives and calls student or calls St. Louis home, uh, because St. Louis will become your home for the next two plus years if you decide to join us. Uh, so we'll talk about those things too. We have another virtual info session at the end of April, um, which will be a crowdsourced topic. So start thinking about things that you really wanna know about and we'll give you an opportunity to weigh in on what you wanna learn more. And on May 1st is that deadline to submit your intent to enroll for fall 21. I want to thank again, all of my panelists uh, for giving their time today to share more about the really amazing and important work that you're doing. Um, Again, if you have any questions for us, please feel free to reach out and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thank you again.